The second part of this talk is about some of the data quality issues researchers should keep in mind when they're analyzing biosocial data. Uh, and I'll be talking about two kinds of issues in particular. One is about the mode or collection condition, when, wh whether that's important and whether that should be taken into account when analyzing biomarkers. And I'll also be talking about some of the quality control or QC processes that should be looked at at least by uh, social science researchers when they're looking at uh, biological data sets. Um, a number of biosocial studies tend to use two kinds of methods to collect biomarker data. Uh, the, the gold standard the, the, is the clinic coll collection. That's because it's very standardized. It's a very standardized process. Participants are invited to come to the clinic, and so the blood samples are collected and stored and processed immediately. And so, because that's a very controlled environment, uh, the 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 the, mar the biomarkers that are obtained are, are thought to be of a very high quality standard. And that's the um, the way how a number of of studies in in the UK have collected their biomarkers. The Avon longitudinal study, for example, ELSPAC. The uh, 1946 birth cohort study, uh, when, the, when the participants were age 63, the Hertfordshire cohort study, and the Whitehall II civil servant study. The other way of collecting biomarkers, uh, blood-based biomarkers, are when uh, participants are visited at home and their blood samples are collected and then posted to a laboratory. And that's the case with Understanding Society, the Southampton Women's Study, the 1946 uh, birth cohort study when the participants were aged to 53, the Health Survey for England, and the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. Now, when people are invited into a, a clinic condition, uh, as I said, it's a very standardized environment, so the, the temperature is standardized, for example, the collection conditions are, are standardized, and, and a blood sample is usually drawn through a venipuncture, so they, they draw blood from uh, through, through a person's veins, and that blood sample is immediately processed and then either stored in the freezer or the blood analytes are measured then and there. In contrast, in, in population surveys, what happens is that uh, there's, a, there's, there's a delay in the processing of that blood sample and the storage of that sample. And here we've got some examples of, of sort of the different conditions in which uh, blood samples are, are taken and stored. Uh, in the top uh, left-hand corner, we've got a, a, a nurse in a clinic setting, and as I said, that's, that, that is a co very controlled environment. And so the, the blood that the nurse draws is immediately uh, stored and processed uh, in, 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 in very high-quality ways, whereas on the top right-hand corner, we've got a, a, a sort of nurse taking blood pressure, but could be taking blood as well from a participant at home. And there, the environmental factors are, are much more variable. For example, the, the room temperature could be, could be highly variable from one uh, home visit to, to the next. Uh, the time of day is, is particularly important as well. So in a home visit, uh, the nurse may not have uh, complete control on what the participant did or just prior to the, uh, their visit. So the, the person could, for example, have um, smoked or had a lot of food, which could influence their levels of biomarkers. Whereas in a clinic visit, there's to some extent some control over uh, the person's activity, the respondent's activities just before the, the, the samples are taken. Um, as these, this, the blood samples that are taken by the nurse in a home visit are usually um, stored in particular ways and they can be uh, sent by post, for example, in the, in the Jiffy bag. Uh, and and the, 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 the process of posting the blood samples, you know, the, the environmental conditions in which these uh, blood samples are, are then uh, exposed to are, are, as you might imagine, quite different from uh, the setting in a clinic situation where the blood samples are stored immediately in freezers. And in the bottom right hand condition, uh, bottom right hand part of the slide, you see some pictures of, of, of other conditions that affect both home visits as well as uh, clinic uh, blood sample collections, which is that uh, the, 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 whether it's a weekday or weekend or what month of the year, all of these factors do tend to affect some of the, the, the blood-based biomarkers. So it's important to keep these in, in mind, these considerations, considerations in mind when analyzing biosocial data. In the top uh, graph, uh, I've shown you some uh, 
um, the distribution of the times in which uh, nurses visit the, the, the people at home in, in understanding society and we see that it's a bimodal distribution. We see that uh, nurses tend to visit people just after 10 o'clock or uh, just uh, it, or if people are working, they tend to visit people at home uh, around 6 or 7 p.m. at night. So you can imagine that if these are the times in which uh, blood samples are taken uh, and time of day has an effect on particular uh, analytes, um, then we really need to be considering what time uh, people took their, their, their biological samples. Uh, in the bottom picture, we've got a, a diurnal distribution of the stress hormone cortisol. And in general, people have a, have a very marked diurnal pattern. So as, as people get up there, their cortisol levels shoot up. And then over the rest of the day, their cortisol levels come down. So you can imagine a nurse visiting somebody at home, uh, collecting cortisol data in the morning, is likely to have very different levels of, of the stress hormone cortisol compared to a nurse visiting somebody else uh, later in the evening. I'd also like to talk about some of the quality control issues that uh, researchers should be aware of when looking at the biomarker data. Uh, and that is largely down to the labs that process these uh, blood-based biomarkers. And uh, they're divided into internal and external quality control processes. Um, some of the biomarkers have impossible values. So, uh, for example, some biomarkers like height and weight, uh, they're, they're likely to, you know, you can imagine some, if you have somebody in your, in, in, in your data set that is 10 meters tall or 1,000 kilograms uh, in weight, you can imagine, you know, that, that it's going to be hard to anonymize that person because, you know, they're, they're going to be a, one, um, a completely unique individual. So you, you can pretty much rule out that, that there are impossible values. So it's, it's good to, for, you know, look at the distribution of, of, of your biomarkers to see whether there are in some impossible values and, and you know, and, and treat them as outliers. Um, but independently of that, when the biomarkers, the blood-based biomarkers are processed in a, in, in a laboratory, the lab, what the laboratory does is that it tests when it, when it, when it goes through the procedures that, that derives the blood-based analytes, it repeats this on another day to, and hopefully there's a very strong correlation between uh, the, the analytes that they get on one day compared to another day. So that's called the intra-assay coefficient of variation. And you know, ideally we want that, uh, we want there to be a very small amount of variation. So less than 5% is within accept acceptable limits. So that's comparing how uh, one particular biomarker within a lab compares to uh, the same biomarker when it's, when it's processed on another day. But the external quality control uh, measures are comparing how the lab does in relation to other labs in processing the same analyte. And that's measured through the standard deviation index. So it's, it's a measure of total error uh, in, 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 in analyzing a particular biomarker in comparison with all the range of labs that have, that have analyzed that particular analyte. And so once again, we're trying to get at low values of the standard deviation of index. We, we want to have very little, we want, we want to have uh, the, 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 the analyte that is measured by the, this particular lab to be close to the, to, to, to the overall uh, levels that are measured by uh, all, the, all the labs. So a score between uh, below one standard deviation index is, is generally very good. And I, also, I'd like to talk about specific biomarkers. So, I've, so far I've been talking about biomarkers in general, but you, as, when we get at sort of specific blood-based blood biomarker analytes, we should be keeping in mind that each one of them has a different meaning, has a different significance. So this slide and the next slide looks at uh, one particular measure called C-reactive protein, CRP for short, and it's a measure of systemic inflammation. Uh, and uh, usually the, you know, somebody that has values of CRP between three and 10 uh, milligrams per liter is, is, is denoted to have uh, you know, systemic inflammation. However, somebody could have greater than 10 uh, mg per, per liter uh, CRP values, which denotes a current or recent infection. So the meaning of high levels of CRP is completely different when it's when it's over 10 
as compared to when it's between 3 and 10. So when it's between 3 and 10, it's, a, it's considered a, a measure of cardiovascular risk. When it's over 10, it's a measure of infection. So very often people, when they're analyzing uh, CRP in relation to car cardiovascular risk, they delete uh, values greater than 10 because they're, they're not interested in whether or not somebody has been uh, recently infected. CRP is also very strongly influenced by people's medication and uh, their anti-inflammatory medications, statins, contraception, and hormone re replacement therapy. In this slide, I show uh, the distribution of CRP for men and women. Um, and one thing you'll notice immediately is that the distribution is highly skewed. So when we're measuring, when, when we're analyzing CRP as a dependent model in a, a sort of regression model, for example, as a dependent variable in a regression model, you might want to think of ways to try and normalize this distribution in order to get, uh, in order to make the assumptions underlying regression models more plausible. So to sum up about uh, data quality issues to keep in mind when analyzing biological data sets, we need to consider the, the normal ranges of the biological variables, um, you know, if they are available. We need to be able to identify outliers and, and do something about the outliers. Um, we need to hopefully ident identify whether the respondent has taken any relevant medication and either control for it or maybe delete people with particular medications from the analysis if that is not central to your research question. Uh, we need to consider some of the statistical transformations for highly skewed biological dependent variables if we're looking at that in a regression modeling context. Uh, we definitely need to keep in mind the context of the blood sampling, uh, like the time of day, the room temperature, whether or not somebody had a recent operation, uh, if the person had recently smoked uh, or, to, or had, had food or alcohol, and also keep in mind the laboratory-based quality control processes in producing the biological data. Is it a good lab that has, um, that has produced these biomarkers?